So 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Apostle Paul, this guy was once a great persecutor of God's people. Uh, if you have read this collection of ancient documents that we like to call a Bible these days, there's a book in there called Acts. It's in the New Testament, written by a guy called Luke. Luke did a whole bunch of research and, and studied and interviewed people and so on to find out uh, and to present to us in this document a history of the first 30 years of the Christian church. It's called the Book of Acts. And uh, one of the characters we come across in that early in that uh, story is a guy by the name of Saul. And Saul doesn't like Christians. Saul is a persecutor of those that follow Jesus. Back then, our movement was called The Way. I still think that's pretty cool. I'd love to go back and be called The Way. I think it's a trendy name. It's a great name because it was about a way of life, not just following a philosophy. It was a way of life, and that way of life was walking daily with Jesus, going where Jesus was going, believing what Jesus said, trusting him, and so forth. And so we got this character called Paul. And Paul's a persecutor of the church. Paul has this amazing encounter with God. Jesus appears to him when he's on his way to a place called Damascus to persecute more Christians, lock them up, throw, the, throw them in prison, and so on. And on the way there, Jesus reveals himself to him. And this guy went from being somebody that wanted to kill and crush this movement that you and I are a part of today called the church, to being one of its greatest advocates, to going out and planting churches, and so on. It was an amazing transformation from complete darkness to complete light. And it happened because he encountered a resurrected Jesus. Amen? How many people in this room have a similar story? You've gone from complete darkness to complete light because you encountered a resurrected Jesus. Anybody else in the room? Any believers in Jesus in the room? Yep. He writes this to a group of believers in a city called Corinth. He says, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel. Every now and then, we need to be reminded. That's why Easter is a great thing. comes around every 365 days as a bit of a reminder. A bit of a reminder that, hey, this is not just something that we, Christianity is not just something that we do because, you know, well, somebody came up with a great philosophy 2,000 years ago, right? And, and it made such sense and it was kind of anti-establishment at the time, so we ran hard after it and there's a trickle effect down throughout history where we still meet based on these vain philosophies or these beliefs or these philosophies. No, no, his, uh, Christianity has a historical uh, uh, moment in time. Christianity has a historical foundation. It's not based on a book. It's based on an event in human history, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the man, Jesus Christ. It's based on a historical event. You may not understand everything in this collection of ancient documents. That does not let you off the hook. What do you think about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus? That's what matters. That's what matters. Do we believe in the death, in the burial, and in the resurrection of Christ? That's the key thing for Christians. When people say that your faith has no foundation, your faith is just pie in the sky. No, it's not. Our faith is based on an actual historical event, something that actually happened. Now, you can ask some questions around the man, Jesus. Who is he? What did he say about himself? Did he raise... There's a whole bunch of questions around that. And if you, if you come on Sunday, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the reasons why I actually believe in the resurrection, why I actually believe it's true. But now... Faith is based on an actual event. And in 1 Corinthians, Paul writes this. He says, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. They'd taken their stand. They'd planted their feet in faith in Jesus and decided that they were going to live their life the way that he said to live. They were going to live, they were going to put their faith in him. They were not going to live their life trying to get right before God by their own efforts and merits. They were going to trust in what Jesus Christ did on that cross, that Jesus' death made them right, that his righteousness was imputed or placed upon them because they could never make themselves good enough to get back into the presence of God. doesn't matter what you do. doesn't matter how holy you think you are, how many scriptures you've memorized, how many prayers you've prayed, how much money you've given to the church. There's nothing we can do in our own merits and our own strength that's going to make us right with God. We are too far gone for that. We are. As a human race, we're too far gone. Now, you might not think you're too far gone if you compare yourself to the guy next to you. you know? Everyone look to the person to the left and go, eh, I'm not doing too bad, actually. You know? The person to the right, and you might go, oh, no. Eh. But the thing is, we're not going to be judged by human standards, are we? we? We don't come before God based on human standards. We don't come before God and go, but, but I'm real. Compared to my wife, God, you should see me. You know? My little hot cross bun. Cut that one out. <laughs> but we're not. 
God is holy. God is perfect. There is no blemish. There's no darkness. There's no shadow in God. God's, God's perfection is so far beyond human capacity. And so it doesn't matter how good we are. We need this moment in human history. We need what Jesus did on the cross. We need that. Because we're never going to be able to stand before God in our own efforts. He says, by this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise you've believed in vain. I love that too because he's saying to him, it doesn't matter that you believed it yesterday, you're still going to believe it today. It doesn't matter that you walked in it once, or you're still walking in it. Because you can, you can believe and then just kind of get blasé about it or move away from it. And he says, if you, that kind of belief is belief in vain. Don't have a faith that's belief in vain. Live it today. Live it now. Live it every moment. Live it every moment of your life. He says, you don't want to have a faith that's in vain. And in verse 3, he says, For what I received, I passed on to you as a first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He says that of first importance, here's what I received. Here's what was given. Here's what was told to me. And if you go to Galatians, I think it is, Paul talks about, I didn't get my gospel by going and sitting down with Peter or with John or somebody. He says, I got my, my gospel by divine revelation. God spoke to me. And then in, in 1 Corinthians, he tells us what God told him. And this is what God told him. He said, the gospel is this, the first part of the gospel, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He didn't just die. He didn't just tell us what he did, that he died. He tells us why he died. He died for our sins. For our sins, your sins and my sins. The things that we have done that, that we, where we have fallen short of God. And our best works, our best works are like filthy rags in the eyes of God. Why? Because his standards are so far beyond our ability to reach. The Jesus story is not one that should encourage a person to try harder to reach up to God. It's God's effort to say, hey, I love you so much, you'll never get to me. So I'm going to reach down to you through the person of Jesus. I'm going to do for you that which you will never be able to do for yourself. It doesn't make you a loser. It makes you human. It doesn't make you, you unreachable. It just means that you're human and you need Jesus. And everybody on this planet needs Jesus because none of us are righteous, not one. And that's what we're remembering today, the death of Jesus. And if everything he said about his life and death is true, if everything the writers of this collection of ancient documents wrote is true, and if God really is in control of the world to the degree that these ancient documents tell us, then Jesus' death is the most important event in human history. And it was not just another cruel and barbaric act carried out by Rome on an innocent Jewish man. It was far more than that. The death of Jesus was pre-planned. Not by Romans and not even by some religious leaders. Jesus himself knew that when he came to this world, as his life went on, he knew that he was born to die. And he knew that he was born to die, not for what he did wrong, but for what everybody else was doing wrong. Imagine that. He's going around preaching and doing good and healing and casting out demons, knowing that these people that I'm doing good for, in the end, I'm going to ultimately pay my life for the bad they did. Every person he healed was part of the problem as to why he had to go to the cross, but he healed them anyway. Every person he delivered was part of the problem as to why he was going to end up at the cross, but he delivered them anyway. Isn't that amazing grace? What an amazing picture of God's love for us. For God so loved the world. John 3, 16, the most quoted scripture. God so loved the world, he gave his only son. Not God so hated sin or so mad. At, no, God so loved the world. He died for our sin. Just doesn't say he died for sin. He died for your sins. He died for your sins. He died for my sins. And Jesus knew this. Mark 10, 45, for even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus knew that his life was going to be a payment for something other than himself. What is a ransom? It's something that you exchange for the freedom of another. And Jesus knew. He said he knew what his life was about. That he was ultimately going to die. That he was ultimately going to give of himself so that somebody else could experience freedom and liberty. And that somebody else is you and me. John 10 verse 17 to 18. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me. I'm not being forced to do this. At one point Jesus said in the garden of Gethsemane when the soldiers came to get him. Jesus said uh, you know what to his disciples back up. If I want to get out of this I can call ask my father to give me legions of angels and he will. But I came for a purpose and a reason. And not my will, yours be done. He prayed in the garden. His was a life fully committed to the will of God. And the will of God for his life was that he would pay the price for your life. Isn't that amazing? So that you and I don't have to face that penalty that we deserve. And as Paul already mentioned, not only was it pre-planned, it was predicted. Paul said that Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. 
according to the scriptures. It was predicted long ago. The high priest Caiaphas at the time when Jesus was alive in John eleven fifty 50 to 52, he said this. He said, you do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. He did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. And not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God to bring them together and make them one. So from that day on, they plotted to take Jesus' life. It sounds like they knew what God was saying, but they didn't quite understand what God was saying. Parents probably know the feeling. I know what you're saying, son, but I just don't understand it. The scriptures that Paul's referring to is not the New Testament. He's talking about the Old Testament when he says that Christ died according to the scriptures. In the New Testament, when they talk about the scriptures, how many of you know these, these guys that wrote these letters and that? They had, no, they had no inkling or understanding or intentional thought that one day I'm going to be bound up and put in this thing and they're going to call it the Bible and it's going to be the biggest selling book of all time. They weren't trying to be authors. They were just trying to document the truth as they eyewitnessed it themselves or as they had researched it and found out the facts or as they felt the Spirit of God moving upon them to speak and to write. They had no agenda. It's like when we call it a book, a book, start, a book has a plot line. Before you sit down, an author starts a book. He's got a bit of a plot line. This is how it's going to start. These are the main characters. This is what's going to happen in the end. Here's the twist, and here's the ending. Then they start writing. They don't get 10,000 words into it and then go, oh, hang on, how's it going to end? I don't know. I didn't think about that. These guys didn't collude together. They didn't sit in a room and go, you write about this bit, you write that, you write that, and let's just make up this great, wonderful story. They didn't do that. It's amazing. This, this, this thing, people say they've never seen a miracle. Hold your Bible up. That's a miracle. That is a miracle right there <laughs> that we still have this when nations have tried to burn it and discard it and get rid of it and cultures are trying to sh shut down the words of Jesus and get rid of the teachings of Jesus, yet we still got it here. That, my friends, is a miracle worth celebrating. But when Paul writes to the Corinthians, he says, Jesus died, according to you, uh, died for your sins according to the Scriptures. He's speaking about the Old Testament. And the, and the, the, the most famous or the most expansive uh, passage in the Old Testament that speaks about the coming Messiah, that speaks about Jesus, would undoubtedly be Isaiah 53. Isaiah chapter 53. I don't want to read the whole thing, but if you have time, go home today after the service. I want you to get out a Bible, and I want you to dust it off or whatever you've got to do, and I want you to open to the prophet Isaiah, and I want you to slowly read through Isaiah chapter 53. And as you read through Isaiah chapter 53, I want you to go, wow. How did this guy who wrote this 700 years before Jesus came, how did this guy know? Well, I think God pre-planned it. I think God predicted it. I think God was doing something through the death of this Jewish man, Jesus. And in verse 4 and 5, it says, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace, everybody say peace. Peace, isn't that a wonderful thing? Peace, the punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds were healed. Many of us would agree the biggest cry of the human heart is peace. The greatest search, that the quest that we all go on from birth to death, most of that quest is about trying to find this elusive thing called peace. Most of it is about trying to find this thing called peace. And yet, the prophet Isaiah links this moment that we're remembering today, the death of Jesus, to the very pursuit of that very thing. Peace. He says, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. Many, many years ago, me and my wife went to the Solomon Islands. Some of you I might have shared this story before. We went uh, on a boat. And uh, now, what I didn't realize at the time when we got over to the islands was that we were the last plane out of Brisbane and a cyclone had come through. And so they shut down the airport. We, we'd just gone out of there. And we get down there and we land and I take her to this little hotel place where sometimes I stay. I've been there in and out numerous times. And I said, you have a rest and a shower, whatever, here. I'm going down to the dock. I was going to find a boat because I just find any boat that's going across to Malaita, the island we're going to. And uh, I'll just hook up with a fish arrow or somebody. And uh, you just jump on the fishing boat. They'll drop you across for a few dollars. So I hook up a ride, come back, tell Jackie, right, we're leaving at midnight tonight. There's a boat going across. So midnight, we get up, we walk down the docks, we jump on the boat, and the sea's nice and flat and calm. And here we are on the boat, and there's, you know, big barrels of petrol, and there's chickens and goats, and a few uh, yeah, people from the island, Malaita going home and so on, little kids. Anyway, we get on the boat and we start chugging out of the, uh, of, of the harbour and we're heading along and then as we're going along, it just slowly starts to 
just, just a little bit like this, right? You, you all know where I'm going, right? It starts like this, and then before you know it, it then it just sort of starts, we're sucking in the sideways movements as well with this thing, you know? And then before you know it, it's more like this, and it's like this, and we are smack bang in the middle of a, uh, like a hurricane tornado type thing whipping up the ocean and so on. And now I'm, I'm not the smartest tool in the shed, but I do know my wife and I thought, she's probably a bit freaked out right now. <laughs> probably a bit worried. I could tell because I could only see from that far back. The rest was in the wooden planks she was sitting on. And so me being the husband, what do I want to do? Well, I want to bring peace to my wife. I want to do something that's going to calm my wife down. So I have my system in place of how I'm actually going to calm her down. And this is what I did. I, I started by saying to her, you know what, Jackie, it's okay because right now the locals aren't panicking. I mean, these guys know these waters. They know the boats. The locals aren't panicking, so we shouldn't either. And as I said that, all of a sudden... Wah! The kids start screaming, the wives start jumping, the chickens are bouncing around, the crew start yelling, it's, and I'm thinking, okay, strike one out. And then I said to her, well, but it's okay, Jackie, because here's the thing, that God gave Noah the specifications for boat building, so if we do tip, we'll come back up the right way, it's okay. I don't know why I thought that was going to calm her down, but that didn't go down well either. And so I'm standing against the side of the boat and I could see that this is not going well. Alan, you are not doing a great job of bringing peace to your wife. And so I had one trick left up my sleeve. I said, Jackie, it's okay. We're not taking in any water at the moment. And literally, as I said, that a wave jacked up behind me, hits me in the back of the head, flew me across the floor on my face. And I thought, God, I give up. It's all in your hands now, you know. Grab something quick. Tie yourself down. We're going <laughs> to... Anyway, the boat, the, the driver eventually realised we're going to die out here, so he knocked around behind, found a little cove in a little island, and we just sat there all night until the storm went down. Then the next morning, when the storm had gone down, he turned around, and, and we continued our little trip to Malaita. Needless to say, on the way back, we did not get on the same boat, did we? I looked after you. We got on a bigger boat on the way back. It didn't matter what I did to try to bring peace to my wife, I could not bring peace to her. It didn't matter what I did, it didn't matter what I said, and it makes sense, because if the truth's told, I can't bring peace to my own life. I tried for years and years to bring peace into my own life, and I didn't do a really good job of that either. I tried this, I tried that, I looked over here, I looked over there, I, I, I got involved in this, I started doing that, I stopped doing that, and I couldn't find peace, not a peace that lasted. Not a peace that lasted. See, peace is something that's very, very hard to manufacture, and even if you think you've managed to create it, you can just as easily lose it because of the pressure of trying to maintain it. <laughs> trying to keep all the ducks lined up, that feels great. Okay, finally my life is peaceful. Now I've got to work really hard to make sure nothing disrupts the peace. Well, then you lose your peace trying to keep your peace. It's ludicrous. Peace is something that's really hard to just manufacture and make in our own strength. The simple fact is this. Life is a series of storms, is it not? It's a series of storms. And we look for things that will allow us to try and maintain peace as the wind and the waves beat against us. And the world has sold us a lie that peace comes by changing jobs. I'm not saying it's wrong to change jobs. But changing jobs is probably not going to give you the peace you're looking for. The world's told us that we can have peace by acquiring more money, by getting more toys, by finding the right relationship, by having more followers on Instagram, more validation of how great you are from people you've never met before. I don't quite get that one. The world's told us a lie that peace comes by being recognised by the right people, by getting picked on the right sports team. Or if I can cut a little closer to the bone of culture, I hope I don't offend, but if I could just marry whoever I want, if I could just redefine my identity, if I could throw off the shackles of gender, etc. All these things are a pursuit to try to find this elusive thing called peace. And we come up empty. Or maybe we find peace for a while, but then we realise, hang on, that peace that came into my world when I got that thing, it disappeared when that thing went from my world as well. So all of a sudden, I've got this great relationship. Oh, I feel peaceful. Thank you, Lord. Everything's lined up. And then that person realises your armpits sweat like everybody else and they leave you. <laughs> and all of a sudden, guess what? You've got no peace anymore. So you're running around trying to find something else to give you peace. 2,000 years ago, Jesus died on a cross. 700 years before that, the prophet Isaiah told us one of the reasons that he's dying is to bring you peace. The punishment for your peace was upon him. If you go back to Genesis and you see the first major shift in human behavior was after mankind decided to disobey God. Genesis 3, verse 7 to 8. It says, then, after they ate of the apple, it says, then the eyes of both of them were opened, they realized they were naked. 
They realized they were naked. They looked at each other differently. Instead of this great unified relationship, all of a sudden they realized, oh, hang on, you're naked, I'm naked. We better cover ourselves up. We better keep bits back from each other now. We still do that, don't we? I've got stuff going on in my world, but I'm not going to expose it to anybody. I can't let you see that. can't let you see that hurt, that dysfunction. I can't let you see the, that stuff in my life. And we still cover ourselves up. So they sewed fig leaves together, made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And what did they do? For the first time ever, they hid from God. They hid from God. Their relationship, their peace didn't disappear because of some external thing. They were still in the same garden. They still had the same God. They still had each other. But it's amazing what sin will do. All of a sudden, peace. Peace was taken away. Peace with each other and peace with God. But true peace is found in a restored relationship with God. And that was made possible through the death of Jesus on the cross. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace. I love that. It brought peace to us. The punishment that brought us peace. That word peace, the great Hebrew word shalom, it means completeness, soundness, and welfare. This is what it means. If you break it down, it means to have peace with God, to have the peace of God, and to have peace with others. Isn't that wonderful? The peace that God offers you is peace with God because we're back in restored relationship. The peace of God because his spirit fills our hearts. And then peace with others because of what the Holy Spirit can do in and through us. That's peace. And it doesn't matter whether I lose my job. It doesn't matter whether I lose my girlfriend. It doesn't matter whether my, 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 my peer group no longer like me. That's a peace that goes well beyond externals. It's an internal thing. Jesus said this in John 17. He said, peace I leave you, peace I give you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. So I'm giving you a peace. Don't, don't think about the peace of the world. The peace of God. I'm giving you peace that, as Philippians says, surpasses all understanding. It doesn't make sense. How can I still have this peace with all this stuff going on around me? Because peace comes through a restored relationship with the Creator, not through external things. Not through external things, but we spend our whole life searching externally to try to find it. So you sin can't go unpunished. Sin can't go unpunished. So I listened to a radio station once and this, this caller rang up and she was just talking about how God, and so because God is God and God is, you know, if God is love and so on, then that just means that anyone can do anything they want and God just lets it go because he loves you. Because that's what love is, right? No, it's not. How many of you parents love your children that way? Just do whatever you want, doesn't matter. I'm never going to bring correction. I'm not going to give you any boundaries. I'm, I'm not going to look at you and go, you know, I know some things you don't know, therefore I'm, I'm, I'm pointing you in a certain direction. You may not even understand it at the time, but as a parent, someone with life experience, I know some things you don't, and so sometimes I'm going to clamp down a little bit. Sometimes I'm, I've got to give you guardrails, I've got to give you guidance and so on in life. And if you move outside of that, guess what? Well, sometimes there's a, this little thing called a punishment. Sometimes we do have to, somebody, you know, there's a consequence for that. I thought, that's ridiculous. So apparently, apparently God, who if God is by definition God, he's the ruler of everything and over everything, the greatest being there ever could be, he can't have a single boundary over anything. But if you teach at school, you're allowed to have boundaries for kids, right? If you run a household, you're allowed to have boundaries at home, right? And if people go outside of it, you're allowed to have consequences for that. In the workplace, you're allowed to have boundaries, aren't you? And you're allowed to have consequences if people go outside those boundaries. Every space on planet Earth that works, you know why? Because without... Without consequence and without boundaries, you don't have a functioning world. But somehow God in heaven, he, he can't have any of that. If people would just take a step back sometimes and look at their own logic and look at where that goes, maybe they'd realise it doesn't make a lot of logical sense. And there's something inside of us human beings that gets frustrated when obviously guilty party gets away with something, don't we? When somebody gets away with something and they're obviously guilty, we get frustrated. There's this thing inside of us that goes, that's not right. Well, hang on a second. If God himself can't have any boundaries and God himself can't punish anybody and God himself can't, can't, can't have rail tracks or what's right, then, then how, who do, how do we as human beings have any right to be frustrated at somebody and put our own boundaries on them if God is not allowed to put boundaries? And God is way bigger than us. It just doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make sense. We get frustrated when guilty parties get away with a crime because man's laws, etc., are always up for debate and we're always looking for ways around them, aren't we? We're always looking for ways around them. But God's logical and loving limitations upon man are not up for debate, no matter what we want to tell ourselves. The wages of sin is still death, and without the shedding of blood, there can still be no forgiveness. God's ways are higher than our ways, and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Jesus went through everything on the cross. The very next verse, Isaiah tells us in verse 6, he says this. He says, we all, 
like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on him, on him, the iniquity of us all. The Lord laid on him, Jesus Christ, 2,000 years ago. The consequence of perversity, the depravity, the sin of mankind, it was all laid upon him. So that we could have restored relationship with God and have peace again. That's why we remember today. That's why we gather. And that's why it's a good Friday. Because it certainly wasn't good if you're looking at Jesus and what he went through. It's not good when you hand over the ransom money. But it's a great feeling for the person when the prison doors are open and they're let out. That's what's good about today. We were set free. When we walked away from God's ways, we forfeited God's peace. And this is why we spend so much of our lives trying to regain it again. But peace has been brought to us. It's been brought to us through the death of Christ. We don't need to run around trying to find it. We're not meant to try and create it. We're meant to receive it. We're meant to receive it. I'll just get the musos back. We're going to finish with that uh, uh, song again. Um, you pick. <laughs> it's a great song. Those of you that have been around here for a while, you, you pick. It's awesome. It comes in various forms and shapes. Probably sounds a lot like another song you've heard, I'll guarantee it. Let me show you very quickly in closing what peace looks like. The kind of peace that Jesus wants to give to you and wants to give to me. Mark chapter 4, verse 35 to 41. That day when evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. Watch this. There were also other boats with him and a furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, teacher, don't you care if we drown? And Jesus got up and proceeded to tell them, well, God gave Noah the specs for boat building, so if we go over, we'll come back up. Well, he couldn't say the locals weren't panicking because his disciples were crying and carrying on and woke him up. And the Bible already tells us that water was coming into the boat. It says he got up and he rebuked the wind and the waves. Quiet, be still. The wind died down. It was completely calm. And he said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? He didn't celebrate the calming of a storm, right? Here's what I want you to see. He didn't celebrate the calming of a storm like we do. We preach and we write books about it. Jesus calmed the storm. Look, that's a miracle. But it's really not. If you're the guy that said, let there be, and there was, calming a storm, saying to a bit of wind, shh, calm down, that's not a big one. The miracle there is that there's a man called Jesus. And while the waves are beating and the wind is blowing and the boat is rocking and the disciples are screaming and water's coming in, he's asleep on a pillow. Life is a series of storms. Sometimes God calms the storms. But if he doesn't calm the storm, his highest will is to calm you, give you peace. Peace that even when you go through the storms, even when you're going through the darkest of storms, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear nothing. Jesus died on that cross, according to Isaiah. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And God offers us peace today. Every person in this room, God offers you peace. You don't have to understand everything about God. You don't have to understand everything that's written in these documents. You don't have to have all your ducks lined up theologically. All you need to understand is 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ died on a cross for you. But you are not good enough to get into heaven by yourself. And it doesn't make you a bad person. It makes you human because there's not a human being on planet Earth that has ever been good enough apart from Jesus. He who knew no sin became sin for you. All we have to do is open our hearts and receive all we have to do is make the decision. The, the early church, Peter gets up and, and preaches this message and he says to the crowds uh, all the story about Jesus and he, he tells them, you guys killed him and he was God. And they said to him, what must we do? And he said, it's simple. He said, repent and believe the good news. 
Repentance is not a prayer. It's not about digging up all the dirt you've done in the past. Repentance is a change of direction in your life. Repentance is not a prayer. It's a change of direction. It's making the decision right now. Okay, God, I know that I've been walking away from you. I'm going to make a choice right now with the rest of my days. I'm going to turn and I'm going to start walking in the direction you want me to walk, God. That's repentance. That's repentance. And I'm going to believe. What am I going to believe? I'm going to believe that Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago, that wasn't just a bunch of cruel Romans doing something to an innocent Jewish man. That happened by divine intention, divine purpose. It happened because I needed a saviour. Because I'm guilty. See, I gave my life to Jesus at 19 years of age. And I still don't know everything. And I still don't understand anything. I still got questions. And I still fumble around. But I, but I know this. I know that when I die, I have peace in my heart. I'm going to stand before God. And he's going to look at me and he's going to see Jesus. He's going to see his son on me. He's going to say, Alan, go. And I'm probably going to go, oh, geez, I'm lucky. And he's going to go, you're not lucky. It's Jesus. It's my son. It's my son. Can we close our eyes very briefly? I'm only going to ask this once. If you're here today and you have not given your life to Jesus, you, you haven't. Well, maybe at some point you did, but you know, you know that you kind of stopped. Remember, remember in Corinthians, he says, he, he says that here's the gospel that you believed, but you've got to keep walking in it, otherwise you believed in vain. If you know that you're one of those two and you just want to make that decision this morning, and that's what it is, it is a decision, it is not an emotion, it is not a feeling, it is a choice. If that's you right now, you would love to say, God, Thank you for the death of Jesus. Thank you that that was for me. God, I make a choice today to turn and to live for you and to walk with you. If that's you, just do me a favor. Just throw your hand in here, just real quick. I'm not going to labor on Thank you. Thank you. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. A couple of hands here. That's awesome. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Why don't we all stand together? We're all going to pray together. Let's all stand and pray together. And just, just repeat after me. We had a couple of hands go up. That means there's something going on in heaven right now. Anyone know what that is? It's a party. That's what the Bible says. That when someone comes back, there's this kind of ruck, ruckus in heaven. Don't, don't ever tell me God's not into parties. Let's just pray this together. Lord Jesus, thank you for your death on the cross. Thank you that it was for me. I have sinned. I've fallen short. But I thank you for Jesus. Father, I choose from this moment on to turn around and to walk with you to the best of my ability. Father, I receive your spirit right now to empower me, to lead me, to strengthen me as I take this step towards all you have for me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Bless you guys. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Let's worship, Lord.